The space competition India hopes to win this week by landing first on the moon's south pole is not just about science and status but about money as well. India is opening its space sector to foreign investment to increase its share to five-fold in the global space launch market. India and the world are eagerly awaiting Chandrayaan 3's landing on the moon later today. That's days after Russia's Luna 25 crashed while landing on the moon. But one big factor that can make or break the race is money. Space is booming as business and the moon's south pole water ice may support a lunar colony. Many operations and Mars missions. Under Prime Minister Narendra Modi, India wants to increase its launch market share in the next decade by privatizing and opening the sector to international investment. The success of Chandrayaan 3 will help give a flip to the space industry in India Which with analysts and business executives the expecting rocket. the South Asian the space sector to grow immediately. So far, India has been able to capitalize on its reputation for cost-competitive engineering. The ISRO had a budget of around just $74 million for the mission. In comparison, estimates put NASA's Artemis moon mission cost at about $93 billion through 2025. While the future looks bright for ISRO and the larger Indian space industry, it's not the case with sanctions hit Russia. With the Luna 25 mission failing, analysts feel future moon missions are unlikely to get any major funding. The economic sanctions and the rising cost of Ukraine war do not help Russia's space industry either. Now we're being joined by our senior correspondent Siddharth Hempi, who is joining us from ISRO Telemetry Tracking and Command Network Center in Bengaluru. This is where all the communication with Chandrayaan is taking place from. Siddharth, thank you so much for joining us. Now, to begin with, Siddharth, as I mentioned, now this is not just about, of course, space exploration, which, of course, remains a top priority. It's also about money. What can you tell us about the significance of this mission? Yeah, as you rightly pointed out, it's not just about exploration, it's also about prestige and in the longer round it's about space economy because let's remember the fact that as long as India's space program is concerned, India is among the only players in all of Asia to have a completely end-to-end -end space program. Of course, China and Japan have two Chinas much ahead. Japan also has a very sophisticated space program. But in terms of end-to-end -end capability and in terms of catering to the international launch market, India stands out like you rightly pointed out. This is given the fact that owing to low cost uh, rockets such as the PSLV, SSLV and GSLV, India has been launching foreign satellites. Over the years, over the last few decades, India has launched more than 430 satellites for foreign customers and this has brought in millions of revenue to the Indian Space Agency and its respective commercial arm. Let's remember the fact that the more you do Luna missions, the more you do upcoming astronaut missions like Gaganyaan, what happens is your reliability as an agency goes up many fold in the international launch market and it is that phase that attracts customers because what a customer wants is a reliable launch. In space, all they want is reliability. Nobody looks for friendship or anything. It's just purely business-like. So if a customer today comes to India and approaches saying they want to launch their rocket, they are approaching India because they have faith in ISRO's technology, they have faith in ISRO's rocket and they believe that this mission can be uh, accomplished successfully. So that's the economy aspect. Even in addition to that, uh, let's remember as far as private industry is concerned, ISRO's missions today, almost if ISRO spends 100 crores on a mission, at least 90% of that amount is funneled into Indian industry because a large part of the operations carried out by ISRO today, especially the building of rockets, the building of spacecraft, and uh, you know sourcing components a lot of it is done from uh, indian industry so there are huge consortiums that india has built up over the years both government run and private run all of them sort of provide so some of the rocket engines uh, that the lvm3 rocket uses some of the other engines that are used in this mission are all built by private industry so this is the kind of uh, push that the indian government has been you know doing since 2020 to increase the share increase the you know, wherewithal of the private industry to be able to increase India's share in the global space economy. Right now, India's share is barely about 2%, but India's goal is lofty. Over the years, India wants to take its uh, take a larger share of the global space economy, which is estimated to be worth $1 trillion by almost 2030. Him. Right. 
Well, Siddharth, thank you so much for all the inputs on that and all the figures. But uh, just let's get into the details, of course, of the mission here as well. Frozen water reserves, let's talk about that, in the South Polar region are said to be a game changer. Why is that so? So, so far, uh, the first time when man landed on the moon, Neil Armstrong and his team of astronauts and thereafter, the subsequent crew of uh, Apollo mission astronauts, when they landed, they landed near the moon's equator. So, there they found that the moon is completely dry. In the initial years, based on the technology they had at that time, they concluded that the moon was completely dry. And after a handful of Apollo missions were executed successfully, America decided it's no longer worth going there, both for political reasons, economic reasons and for science reasons. So they shelved the Apollo program after Apollo 17. After 1972, astronauts have not gone to the moon. But what changed is from the uh, you know mid-1990s until 2020, there's been multiple spacecraft of NASA, ISRO, you know, of Japan and even of Korea that have gone to circle the moon. With each of these missions, uh, discoveries have improved. Water, water ice, hydrogen, oxygen, all of these have been found and there's traces of this and also solid evidence of water ice existing. So water ice, as you rightly pointed out, is a game changer because if you have water on a planet, there is every means to sustain life artificially on that particular planet because, for example, in the International Space Station, how the astronauts generate water, they have a hydrogen fuel cell. After that reaction, you get water and that's how they drink uh, drinking water. And there's also sophisticated purification systems. But on the moon, if you have water ice, if it is found to be in a certain pure form, you can directly purify that and use that, if at all that is a possibility. Water is also crucial because water has hydrogen, water has oxygen, H2O. When you split that, you get hydrogen and oxygen, which when super cooled can be used as cryogenic rocket fuel. So in the future, when you can produce fuel on the moon, moon can also be a sort of pit stop, you know, that is 4 lakh, almost 3.84 lakh kilometers away from Earth. So you want to go to deep space, you want to go further than the moon. You can make a stop at moon, you can refuel, and then you can head deeper into space. Moon can also be a sort of outpost or a settlement for humanity to look for minerals, to look for energy sources, to look for anything that can make life better on Earth, and to look for scarce resources for which there is already a huge, you know, uh, rush between several countries on planet Earth, our home planet, Him. Right. Well, Siddharth, thank you so much for bringing us all these inputs on this.